Good morning, church family. I'm continuing our real life sermon series today, and I'm going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. So if you get the chance, go ahead and turn there with me in your Bible. Now, I, do, I, want, to, I want to give an announcement too while I got everybody's attention. We've got a gentleman that attends our university campus regularly. He is not here this morning, and his name is Sam Crawford. And Sam has done some time in prison and has gotten out, and God's given this guy a vision to help youth from the inner city. And uh, to do that, he is starting a boxing gym for troubled uh, young people in the inner city from the Twin Cities area, in Monroe and West Monroe. And he's, he's got an event. The church is behind this. We're helping him get his boxing gym set up. Um, we're offering some support. We, we have been praying for him and are really trying to encourage him. T- today at 3 p.m., I promised him I would make this announcement, uh, on February 25th at the African American Museum. The address is 1051 Chenault Park in uh, Monroe. And there's going to be a, a, it's an event. There's going to be some uh, speaking, some opportunity to connect. Sam's going to tell you what this specific ministry and mission is about. And at White's Ferry Road, we love everybody and we want to unite our community, church. And this is a guy who's in an area that is so desperately needed. And if you get the chance at 3 o'clock at the African American Museum, 1051 Chenault Park Road, that's at 3 o'clock today, pop out there. I'm going to be out there. I want to support this guy. Shake the man's hand, give him some encouragement, let him know you're from his church family, and get behind this ministry and mission. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into my text now. This is Ecclesiastes chapter 12. But before I go there, I'm, I'm going to give you some background on the man who wrote Ecclesiastes. This guy's name is Solomon. And Solomon was arguably the wisest king in all of history. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, he, Solomon, who's just been this freshly, newly minted, crowned king, starts to look at himself and he feels really inadequate. And he asks God for wisdom. So I'm going to give you this background. This is 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. You don't have to turn there if you're already in Ecclesiastes. I've got this for you up on the screen. The Bible says this. Solomon prays and asks God, Uh, for wisdom. The Bible says, this night God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Solomon, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered God, you have shown great kindness to David, my father, and have made me king in his place. Now, Lord God, let your promise to my father, David, be confirmed for you have made me king over a people who are as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me wisdom and knowledge that I may lead this people for who is able to govern this great people of yours. And because Solomon asked the Lord for wisdom, God granted his request. Now, we don't get this particular story that I'm about to share with you in 2 Chronicles. This this story I'm about to share with you is in 1 Kings chapter 3. But right after this moment in 1 Kings, two ladies come to Solomon and they're debating over, what, uh, over who is the mother of this particular baby that they bring into Solomon's presence. It's kind of a famous story. Solomon listens to these ladies kind of go back and forth for a while. And he says, that's it. Bring me my sword. And one of the ladies says, yep, fine. Go get the sword. And the, and the other mom says, fine. Give the baby to this woman. It would be better for me not to live with my son than to have my son killed today. And Solomon says, ma'am, I'm going to send the baby home with you because I know the true mother of this child would not allow herself for this baby to be killed. So there's a lesser known story that you may not have heard that I want to share with you about Solomon's wisdom. There are two uh, ladies who bring a very handsome, young uh, CPA, an accountant, in a three-piece suit uh, before Solomon. And each of these ladies is, is arguing and debating that this man has told one of their daughters that he would marry them. And so they, they bring this, young man, this handsome young accountant in a three-piece suit before Solomon. And the first lady says, Solomon, this man has promised to marry my daughter. 
And the second lady says, no, Solomon, that's not the truth. This man has promised to marry my daughter. And Solomon does the same thing. He listens to them haggle and try to make their pitch and try to make their case. And finally Solomon says, bring me the biggest sword in the kingdom. And the first lady says, that's great, Solomon, go ahead and get your sword. And the second lady says, oh, Solomon, don't, never mind, I'm going to let this young man marry this other lady's daughter because I can't bear to see him cleaved in two. And Solomon says, I've got it. I know whose daughter this man has promised to marry. And they're like, which one? And he said, it's the first lady that was willing to have him killed. Certainly, she's prepared to be his mother-in-law. That's in the second book of opinions. You'll have to look real hard to find that. You know, I wanted to just make the case that Solomon was a wise man. And wise men always seek the Lord. The hallmark quality of a man filled with wisdom is that man has a hunger to be in the presence of God. And if you want to be a great leader, either of a family or in your career or in your neighborhood, the first thing you've got to do is seek after the Lord with every fiber of your being. And can I just say that that's what transformed my life personally. When I decided that I was going to be a sellout, When I decided that I was going to imitate the Lord in every way I possibly could, that's when things in my life radically transformed. And Solomon asks something of God that I think lots of us probably wouldn't have asked for if God comes to our room at night and would say, hey, ask for whatever you want and I'll grant your request. Probably in some of our minds, the first thing that would come up is money. God, grant me all the money in the world. I really do want a money tree, Lord, in my backyard. Some of us would ask for something like happiness or success. But wise men and wise women seek for things that can't be taken away. And Solomon asked for wisdom. And God granted his request. I just want to say this also, which is not really part of the sermon, but worth mentioning Church family, God is still in the business of answering prayer. When you go to the Lord and you ask in the name of Jesus, God hears your prayer and knows your situation, and he is still in the business of answering prayer. I want you, like Solomon, to boldly go before the Lord when you feel inadequate, when you feel inefficient, or when you feel insecure. And I want you to seek strength from the Lord your God. So I'm going to get into Ecclesiastes chapter 12 right now, and I'm going to spend all our time this morning talking from verses 9 and 10. And in this real life sermon series, what Mike and I have been wrestling with, man, our church has been hit very hard lately. Uh, We've had some very serious illness, some marriages in distress, individuals dealing with very significant personal problems, And, and we got to just talking and feeling the weight of that. And and thinking, man, real life is tough. Life is going to throw things our way that are difficult to understand, that are painful beyond what it feels like our capacity to withstand is, and other things that just are really tough for us to handle. And in this real life sermon series, we want to point you to the individual being that has the solutions for any issue you face in life, which is God. And that's how to really live in real life. Can I get an amen? In Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon, who is the wisest guy arguably in history, is basically writing a journal. So as we're working through Ecclesiastes and you're reading this, what you're getting is the journal of a preacher or a teacher. And what's really profound about this is how candid and authentic Solomon is. There are lots of moments in here where he's saying, I've tried everything from sin to success and all in between that the world has to offer, and it's all meaningless and made me feel miserable. But in this, protect, in this particular text this morning from Ecclesiastes 12, we get some insight into what Solomon is trying to do as far as the wisdom he's received from God is concerned. So let me give you our text this morning. The Bible says this, Not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. 
He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. I want to break this down into just a few ways. The first thing I want to say is that Solomon was wise. And as I've mentioned, wise men and wise women seek after the presence of the Lord. In our text this morning, we get the clarity that Solomon is actually who wrote the book of Proverbs. And Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 6 says this, The Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. If you need wisdom in life, if there's a problem that you're facing, if there's a situation in your life that's difficult... Seek after God. When Kirsten and I moved down to Monroe and West Monroe area, we felt really terrified. We didn't know anybody. And as we got involved in the community, we started to look for people that we could connect with that had certain qualities that we wanted. Some of those guys that we're still very close with today are Mike and Susan Kellett. These are guys who had a love for God and a marriage and a family that Kirsten and I would like to have had. We connected with Randy and Joni O'Kirby. We also connected with Alan and Lisa Robertson. And I've been told time and time again in my life that if you show me, Trent, your friends, I'll show you your future. And I decided, man, I'm going to spend some time getting to know and befriend the kind of people that have the lifestyle that I want. But the, the being that we have to pursue most closely for the lifestyle that we've been created for is God our Father. If we spend enough time around God, if we can connect with God deeply enough, if we can pursue God diligently enough, our lives will look the way God has intended our lives to look. So how do we do that today? What is required to really pursue God today? Many of you are holding it in your hands. It's God's Word. We have to get hungry for the Lord of the Word. We have to decide, I'm going to pursue God and put enough faith in him to pursue him through the words that he's given us. The first and most important thing we've got to do if we're really going to make it through this real life we're living is to get wisdom from the Lord in the word that he's given us. I want to go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and I want to look at that second part of the ninth verse. Not only was the teacher wise, the Bible said, But the teacher imparted knowledge to the people. In other words, the teacher was deliberate at not keeping for himself the wisdom he had received from God. This was a guy who wanted to share his experiences so that other people could learn from him. And if we read the book of Ecclesiastes, that's the the message and the lesson that we get. Here is a guy who's got all the wisdom in the world who's got almost an unlimited amount of money. Some theologians and scholars who have looked at the wealth of Solomon and calculated it based on inflation to today's standards, listen to this, church, would say his wealth was around $2.2 trillion with a T dollars. This is a guy essentially with unlimited money, unlimited power, and almost unlimited wisdom. And he tried everything he could under the sun to find joy and satisfaction. And he found that nothing satisfied him. And in his journal, we realize that Solomon has made a lot of mistakes. True wisdom comes from God, absolutely. But true wisdom also involves learning from the mistakes of others. Someone put it like this. If you're smart when you learn from your own mistakes, you're truly wise when you're learning from the mistakes of others. One of my favorite writers, C.S. Lewis, talks about learning from experience this way. He says, experience, it's the most brutal of teachers, but dear Lord, you learn, you learn. I hope as we're reading through Ecclesiastes and listening to Solomon's wisdom that he received from God, we're, we're learning from his mistakes. And I want to tell you, church family, that your mistakes do not disqualify you from the calling that God has placed on your life. We're reading in Ecclesiastes the journal of a preacher who's been with women and tried drinks and food and numbers of different things 
that we would be scared to disclose if we'd ever tried. And despite making all these mistakes, God still uses this man to lead his people and grants him the wisdom to do it. You see, Solomon's mistakes don't disqualify him from the calling God placed on his life. And the mistakes you've made in life don't disqualify you either. In Proverbs, which Solomon wrote in chapter 24, verse 16, he says this, Though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again, but the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. What Solomon's saying here, no doubt, is that I've made mistakes. I've fallen and had to get myself up. I've fallen and had to get myself up. And then I've fallen and had to get myself up. But every time I fell, I depended on God and he helped me rise back to my feet after I had fallen. But those that don't pursue the, pursue the Lord are not that way. When they fall, it's hard for them to get back up. The other reason we seek after God is because he can empower us to rise after we fall. I had the opportunity to speak to a group of young men um, in Searcy, Arkansas, who were celebrating two years sobriety from drugs and alcohol. And the slogan, the theme for that particular weekend was Proverbs 24, 16. And the theme was fall seven, rise eight. In other words, don't ever stay down when you get beat down or knocked down. As I was talking to these men, I was telling them the best way to stand when you're in a difficult situation is seek after God and his word. Is really seek for the wisdom of the Lord as he's revealed it to us in his written word. Anytime Kirsten and I are going through a difficult season, if we turn to God's word, we find the strength to stand. So often God reveals truths to us in moments of hardship through his word that we couldn't experience anywhere else. Because that's God's design, that's his plan. He wants not just to impart wisdom to you, but help you rise to your feet in the middle of difficulty. And in the very real life that each of you are living, when calamity strikes or your sin causes unforeseen consequences in your life, I want you to turn to the word of the Lord and let the knowledge God wants to impart into your life be imparted by your diligent seeking after him in his word. In Ecclesiastes, if we would keep going, what we would see is not only was the preacher wise, and not only did he deliberately try to impart knowledge to those that were following after him, but in 12 and verse 9, the last part there, he pondered and searched out diligently many proverbs. And I think it's really critical to understand that God's word is deliberate and intentional. In Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, we get Solomon's thesis statement for the book of Proverbs. And I would go as far as saying that this particular statement from Proverbs chapter 1 is a good thesis statement for all of Scripture. So I want you to listen to this. This is from Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 and 7. And this is Solomon telling you why he wrote the Proverbs. In Ecclesiastes, we understand that the preacher, who is Solomon, ponders and search, searched out and set in order many Proverbs. And in Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, we get the reason why. The Bible says this, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. They're for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, for doing what is right and just and fair. Therefore, giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. So let the wise listen and add to their learning. And let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. Then he concludes his thesis statement by taking us back to where true wisdom begins. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. So you'd have to ask yourself, have there been moments in my life where I could have used additional wisdom and instruction? Have there been times in my life where I needed understanding and insight, where I needed instruction in how to behave and to do what's right and to be just and fair? The answer to those questions for every single one of us church family is yes. 
And where do most of us turn when we have these kinds of questions? And I don't want to see a show of hands, but I bet our first instinct as a rule is not to go to God's word and seek after instruction where he has intended to give us instruction. So often it's, you guys are just like me. Don't, don't be looking at me like that. So often we go to Wikipedia, huh? And look up, man, how to do that, or Google. I cannot tell you, uh, my, my training in school was in counseling. And almost 100% of the time, before somebody gets to my office, they have Googled whatever their problem is. How to deal with depression. How to get my wife to like me more. How to get my husband to help more around the house. And so, so there have been times where people have brought to my office a list from some person's blog about the five great ways to enhance romance in your relationship. And I think to myself, you know, that's just, that's part of our design is to want to know how to, how to overcome the struggles that we face in life. And God designed us that way because he wants us to seek. He wants us to search. He wants us to pursue an answer. But he wants us to pursue the answer in him. And he's given us his word. Solomon says, hey, I, I set out these Proverbs intentionally and, and with with the desire to help you gain insight and understanding. And God's saying, and some of the scriptures our LTC guys read this morning represent that God is telling us that's the purpose for which the scriptures have been written. When you're dealing with something in life and you need wisdom or you need instruction or you need understanding and insight into how to do what's right or how to be just and fair, you, you have a great resource that God wants you to look within. And that's his word. I, I, we, I, I'm a huge fan of the Olympics, and we've been watching the Olympics at my house most nights. And Kirsten and I usually only have 15 or 20 minutes to watch TV, so we've DVR'd it, and we're watching, and we get to fast forward through all the stuff we, you know, that moves slow, right? Not that ice dancing is not a very intense, respectable sport, <laughs> but um, we haven't watched all of those, Okay. So I'm a couple of days behind, but I did get to watch, and if you haven't seen this, you do need to look this up, the, the women's cross-country sprint relay ski team. Have you guys seen this? Let me see a show of hands. There's a couple of y'all that have seen this. So it's the first medal the United States won in cross-country sprint skiing. And these ladies are just incredible athletes. And the United States, uh, coming around the last turn, this lady who's just given it all she's got is being very intentional about everything she's doing. And I don't know enough about cross-country skiing to know everything that she's doing, but the announcer did. And he's going, oh, she's doing this certain thing, and she's cutting this particular corner, and she's using this specific maneuver. And, and as I'm watching this young lady pursue the gold medal, I'm thinking, man, every single movement she's making Almost every single breath she's breathing, she's doing it intentionally. She's received instruction and guidance and understands what's required, and she's putting it all together all at once right in that moment. And if she does what she's intending on doing, she's going to win in this situation. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the purpose God's Word is intended to serve in our lives. We're supposed to be intentional in every single minute of every single day of our lives to live the way the scriptures teach us to live. And if we'll put in that kind of intentional effort at living the way the scriptures teach us to live, whatever the battle is that we're facing, we're going to be victorious because that's God's design for his word. I want to challenge you, use the Proverbs and the Scriptures to find the instruction and wisdom and guidance that you need in your life today. That last verse that, I, that I've been reading and kind of keying off of in Ecclesiastes uh, is verse 10. The Bible says that the teacher, and I love this as a preacher, searched to find just the right words and what he wrote 
was upright and true. This is a guy who, when he was writing the Proverbs, was very careful to select the words that he wanted to write. And God was very careful in selecting the scriptures that he wrote for us that provide us with instruction, insight, and understanding. God was intentional and God was deliberate. And that's the truth. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 5 says, Every single word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. When you're reading God's word, you're looking at a document that is without error. That is a self-evident truth, meaning if you will put this word into practice in your life, you'll see it prove true time and time and time again. It's timeless in that, in that respect. And not only is God's word flawless, but I like that image of, of a shield that we can take refuge behind. So often the enemy's attacking us, trying to destroy us, trying to defeat us. And we get feeling weary and heavy burdened. God's intent is for us to use his word as a shield. To find safety within. To find direction from. And to find guidance. Our first instinct is not going to be to seek after God. It's usually just going to be to do whatever feels right or what we think is right. I've got a couple of kids in my house that I'm raising. Adrian, who's nine, Kyra, who's seven, and Jude, who's five. And we're trying to train them to follow after the Lord and not themselves. And a really good illustration for that is from the movie Pinocchio. Now, let me see a show of hands. Not all y'all have been watching the Olympics. How many have seen the movie Pinocchio? Okay, that's everybody. And there is a character on Pinocchio. Some of you know where I'm going with this already. And his name is Jiminy Cricket. Okay, and he has this slogan that he says to Pinocchio all the time. And he says it in a song, always let your conscience be your guide. And God would tell you the exact opposite. Let, God, let, let, let the word of God and the spirit be your guide. Some of you are right in the middle of a, of a tumultuous storm in life. Some of you are fighting a really intense battle. And life in your life just got real. Some of you, it just got real this last week. And God's here to tell you, man, to get through the real life that you're living, seek for the guidance and wisdom that you're lacking from his word. And let his word be your guide. Every word he's spoken is flawless and true, and it'll serve as a shield to protect you and help you find victory in your situation. If there's a need in your life, as I close with the prayer, I invite you to come forward and connect with the church family who believes in the power of the word of God. And let us encourage you as, as we seek God together in each of our lives. Let's bow. Precious Heavenly Father, I come before you just so thankful for this church. I thank you for the Rise Up event today at 3 o'clock and um, this, this youth mentoring and boxing program that Sammy Crawford is setting up that our church is able to get behind. God, my heart is just grieved that we even have to have those programs. But life is very, very difficult. And we've got we to understand that difficulty and we've got to encourage one another and lock arms with each other and pursue you in your word. And if we do, we'll be victorious. God, there's some people in this auditorium today that need victory. They need your hand to move in their situation. And I pray if any are overwhelmed by just that burden that they would come forward today and seek after you and humble themselves and be ministered to by your spirit. We love you and we thank you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.